In this video, we're going to be looking at simple machines again, and specifically what we're going to be looking at is this simple machine that you see here called a wheel and axle. You might commonly refer to it as a doorknob because a doorknob is a really common form of wheel and axle. And like any simple machine, all simple machines, it has an input side and it has an output side. The input side is where you would put into the machine a force of effort and the output side is where you can move a resistance so you can overcome a resistance force on the output side. So it's very similar to any other simple machine. Well if you look at this wheel and axle from this perspective over here on this side what you would actually see is something like this. You'd see a large wheel surrounding a smaller wheel and the center of both wheels would fall right there. So when the large wheel turns, the small axle turns, and they all turn around that central point, that center of rotation. So if you stop and think about this, it actually is a first class lever. Let me show you what I mean. If I, if I superimpose a first class lever over this wheel and axle, you can see that the fulcrum is at the point of rotation and there is a long arm on this first class lever. There's the long arm right there. And there's also a short arm right there. So that is in fact a first class lever. And you can treat this wheel and axle as a first class lever. The long arm of the first class lever here becomes the radius of the large wheel and the short arm of the first class lever becomes the radius of this smaller wheel or the axle right there. So when you find the ideal mechanical advantage of a wheel and axle you find it the same way you do for any simple machine including this first class lever. The ideal mechanical advantage is equal to the input side divided by the output side. So when you stop and think about that for a first class lever, well it would be the length of the arms. We talked about that at great length in the past. But for a wheel and axle, it's the radius of each of the wheels. So the input side would be the radius of the long the, the large wheel, the radius of the large wheel and the output side would be the radius of the axle. The radius of the axle. So when we actually set this problem up and plug numbers into it, it works like this. And I'm going to say that the large wheel right here has a radius of 8 centimeters. And I'll give the radius of the small axle right here a radius of 2 centimeters. So when I set this up, the input side, which is the radius of the large wheel, is 8 centimeters. And I'm going to divide that by the radius of the small wheel, the axle, which is 2 centimeters. And of course, again, the centimeters factors out because this is just a ratio. It's just going to be a number. And the number is, in fact, 4. And so what we can see here is that if we actually used this wheel and axle, that ideally, discounting friction, this wheel and axle, as you see it right here, should increase any effort force by a factor of four. So if I put over here, if I put into this machine a 10 Newton effort force, how much force of resistance would I actually be able to move over here on the output side. Well we can calculate it like this. The force of resistance that you can move is equal to the IMA times the force of effort that you put into it. So again just plugging some numbers in here the IMA for our wheel and axle is 4 and we're going to multiply that by the effort force and I said the effort force that we put in here is 10 newtons 
at 4 times 10 is 40. So we can actually move with a 10 Newton input force. We can actually move, we can actually get out of this machine a 40 Newton resistance force. We can move a 40 Newton resistance force with only a 10 Newton input force. And that is how a wheel and axle increases the force that you put into it.